presentation. Um, our presenter she go, uses the pronoun she, her, and goes by the handle Killer Bunny. Uh, she is an MDR analyst and threat intel analyst. Warm welcome, everyone, please, for Killer Bunny. All right, thanks. So before we get started, first, I want to say thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Um, it's really nice to see so many people who are as talented as I've seen so far today. It's really cool. So without further ado, further ado Mischievous Goots. Um, this name surprisingly took a very long time to come up with. So. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking a little bit about Atomic Red Team, a set of tests, uh, how you can build an open source testing environment, and what that means to the real world. This is going to be as close to a real world environment as you can get without actually getting a real world environment. So let's get started. That's me. Um, yeah, five years of MDR analyst experience two years of SOC management experience, two years threat analyst and industry report writing, still doing that, it's going well. Uh, and one year as a webinar host, don't know if I'm gonna do that again. Uh, I really like animals, I push permaculture super hard, and if you talk to me, I will push it on you. Uh, I collect hardware, I love yarn, I love chickens, I spin, knit, and crochet. It's a good time. All right. So let's get started. What the hell is Atomic Red Team? It's magic is what it is. So it's a hyper-flexible library of tests for literally just about any purpose that you can come up with. No, literally, any purpose that you can come up with. Um, it's especially useful to test out detectors and logging capabilities within your seam. Uh, it can be run on a local machine or remotely, which is a massive advantage. And it's awesome for big environments or for those who just want to try it on a single VM. You heard me, one single VM. You can just run it on a single Windows machine. Uh, it's currently in the top 20 of the Open Source Security Index, which is actually a big deal. It means it's a very, very good project, very trustworthy, regularly updated. And if that wasn't enough for you, it's used by a lot of companies as a starting point to make some very big products and tools. So why Atomic Red Team? It's free. Everybody likes free things and open source. Uh, it, it has a lot of easy cleanup, unlike most animals. Uh, it works on pretty much every operating system that you could imagine, which is an enormous plus if you want to be actually testing a live environment. Um, and then there's tests for literally almost any situation you can imagine. Uh, you want to take a look at some very basic ingest stuff? Yeah, you absolutely can. You want to see what happens when you execute, I don't know, uh, C2 and XFIL to TikTok? Yeah, you can do that. It is a thing. Uh, and it can make your detection dreams come true. If you're already writing detections, this is how you test them. Okay, so here's what we're doing. We're not doing it live. I, I already am not enough a glut, of a glutton for punishment to do it live. I'm really good at unwillingly figuring out how to bork everything. So not the whole gambit of install, just the really important bits, the things that people usually get stuck on, and what your network map is going to look like so you get a better idea of what we're actually looking for. Uh, we'll take a look at what tools we use in this lab, but as we go, remember these are highly flexible and they may not work for your environment, but gosh darn it, they seem to work for mine pretty darn well, and I tried it with a lot of different things. Um, we're going to configure Security Onion and the Windows Testing VM. We'll emulate an actual threat today. Uh, I wrote up an article on Gootloader and compiled some tests together and specifically built tests for this purpose. So you can go out on the Atomic Red Team repo and you can pull these tests today, and you can use them. And then we're going to sift through the alerts together and understand what we're seeing and how these tests are going to influence logging. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit how you'd use this experience you gained in a production environment and how you can use this experience that you've gained in a production environment, excuse me, and how you can test in production. After all, scalability is key. And no, you do not need to have prior experience with production testing. Set up time. Here we go. All right. This is our stack. If this looks confusing, it's because it is. Uh, we have VirtualBox right here at the top, free, open source, tiny bit finicky, but it works for our purposes. Um, PFSense, if you already have VMs, this part is extremely important. 
PFSense will allow you to create a virtual local area network surrounding your lab so that you don't mess with all your other crap. That's really, really important. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can configure it with a web interface. Once again, PFSense, open source, all these are open source for heaven's sake. Um, with the exception of Windows, but you know what, we're gonna just assume that you know how to get that. Um, yeah, setting up a Windows image with Atomic. Uh, you can use any image that you'd like to work with here. You can pick up Ubuntu, you can pick up an OSX image, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, but the tests you'll run might change based on operating system. That being said, this is very specifically for Windows. Security Onion, that right there is the big piece of the pie. That is our seam. Uh, it will pull information from our testing target via an agent and tell us what is going on. Uh, it will also do some network-based sniffing. So if you're working with a test that's putting out crap onto your network, it's gonna pick it up. Once again, important reason to have a little box around that so you don't pick all the other crap that you're spewing out of whatever other VMs you have. And I wanna make a special mention to Splunk Attack Range. I love the folks at Splunk, I always will, they're fantastic. Um, they built basically this environment that you see in a single tool that quietly tests and pops out all your logs into Splunk. We're not doing that today because you need to actually know how it works before you use it. So, cool, thanks guys, but no. All right, so, once again, we're trying to make this as simple and flexible as possible. This setup works for almost any testing you can imagine. Build yourself an internal LAN classified in VirtualBox as an internal network adapter that your PFSense router and firewall will protect. Your PFSense firewall be, will be the one to provision network for the rest of your machines. So it will have two virtual network interfaces, one that goes out to the internet, one that goes out to the rest of the machines. Um, one of the beauties of PFSense itself is that you actually don't really need to do that much after your initial install. So if you don't want to, you can just kind of set it, forget it, let it go. But you do need the PFSense virtual machine to be up if you want to run networking to any other machines in your lab because it's presiding over that internal LAN. Uh, once again, you can access the web interface with any of your in-lab machines as you would a regular firewall at home, 192, 168.1.1. Uh, you don't need to do much besides setting up a password. So when you're done there, make a note of the network details on your PFSense virtual machine and paste them in a notebook or write them down because you will need them. Oh, there we go, there it is, internal network. Okay, Windows. I'm not telling you how to set up Windows, you know how to set up Windows. Uh, but this is the important part. Make sure that you have an additional network interface for that internal LAN, because otherwise you're not getting network. Okay, Security Onion, here we go. Security Onion is going to take a look at your local network and see all the nasty things going on inside it. When you set up this machine, you're gonna have two interfaces connected to it, your internal LAN, and if you so choose, a host-only adapter with which you can connect directly to your host. This will make moving over machine-specific logs really, really easy. Um, while the host-only interface, again, not super necessary, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, the internal LAN interface will allow you to access the internet and update, sending your connection through PFSense. After you install Security Onion, make a very close note of your IP. Use the so-allow command and choose option B right there, logs dash B, to make sure that you can set up your agent and so that they can communicate. Put that AP in your internal LAN adapter from your Windows machine and it'll allow you to use the Security Onion web portal on your testing machine as if you were an analyst. Ooh. Security Onion, however, cannot just be put on a VM and slapped into place. This is one of those situations where you're gonna have to get dirty and do some work. But don't worry, everybody else has done it for you already. Um, you're going to update your image using the soup command, and you're gonna check the status of Docker containers that it spins up using so-status. It doesn't automatically pull logs from your system, so configuration <coughs> is going to be necessary. The image to the right is winlog beat yaml, a file that you'll be configuring on your Windows machine after you download the winlog beat agent using the Security Onion install guide. 
This is a list of some of the events that we might forward. So we've got our system events, security events, application events that are not older than 72 hours, Windows PowerShell, blah, 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 you get it. Um, and this will all be forwarded under log stash and security onion. WinLog B. This is gonna be important. Uh, these slides are gonna be on my website. WinLog Beat doesn't like playing nice. It really doesn't. So a lot of the tutorials you'll see will say, oh, run WinLog Beat setup. Don't run WinLog Beat setup. It destroys everything. <laughs> you'd, you'd think that they would probably put that in the documentation. Uh, instead, you're gonna go ahead and configure the YAML. You're gonna follow the Guide and Security Onions wiki. And you're gonna start that service, set it to run on startup, and then you're gonna add it to the Windows Defender Firewall exclusion list because we want to actually test our defenses, not Windows. And you wouldn't be surprised how many times people turn off Defender. Don't turn off Defender. <laughs> Side note, Sysmon. This is awesome. Sysmon's great if you really want to get more details on your logs. Uh, a really re great source of this for good config for Sysmon <laughs> is Swift on Security's config. It's pretty readily available. I think there's GitHub open for it. Um, and yeah, just pulls more PowerShell info. I think who doesn't want more info? All right, so we're gonna let it sit a while, and this is what Security Onion's gonna look like. We got all of our, our containers looking okay over there, which is nice to see. We've got our base metrics. Oh my God, look at those metrics. Oh, yeah. Um, if we set up one of the network monitors, we're gonna see everything on the network, too. And again, that part is actually probably easier than setting up log stash. Um, it'll take you a while to configure this and see data. Uh, I mean, it's not gonna ingest right away. It's on a timer. So uh, enjoy this process. Learn about the new tools. Install what you'd like to install. Almost everything mentioned on the Security Onion Wiki is already gonna be activated and ready for you to play with. And it only requires a few quick steps for you to make sure that it's configured to your liking. Come on, there. All right, enough setup, let's get testing. Here's where things get a little meaty. Okay, these are atomic tests. These are two different ways that they're displayed. This is the same test. It just looks really pretty on the left. And that's because it's in markdown format. Everybody loves markdown format. On the right, same thing in YAML. That's how it's gonna be read by the machine. Now, this should give you a better idea of the test's different pieces. Uh, we've got some possible arguments right up top there. We've got our attack commands. We've got some cleanup commands. So after you run the test, you're not left with crap just open and you're not really sure what all is supposed to be open. Uh, and then you've got your dependencies right here. You're gonna want your dependencies. Things depend on them. Now, yeah, either way, uh, you can run this with a, uh, a testing framework which we're gonna go over, or you can run these tests by literally copying and pasting them. It's beautiful, I love it when it's that simple. Okay, so let's try it. That testing framework I was talking about, Invoke Atomic, it automatically pulls and runs the tests with dependencies, automatically cleans up, it does basically everything for you, it makes everything so much better, I love it. Um, but for our purposes, we're gonna go ahead and just run directly atom from Atomic Red Team because we wanna have an understanding of what these commands are actually doing. We wanna be able to see the output. So, goat loader, oh God, that's a lot of text. It deploys payloads, stop right there. It is not the payload. I don't know how many times I've seen people say, oh, goat loader, and it's payload. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have the payload, it deploys it. It uses search engine optimization to poison uh, websites and lure victim downloads. Uh, you might be searching for some legal documents. You might say, oh, how do I kick out my kid at 16, which is a real one that we saw. And it's going to serve you a zip file and it's gonna look like the search that you put in. And when you download that zip file, it's going to have some obfuscated JavaScript in it when you extract when you interact with that JavaScript, uh, WScript and CScript is going to launch something called a C2, or Command and Control Beacon. It's gonna collect information on that machine that it's running on, and it's gonna yeet it out into the internet so that uh, its control station, pretty much, is gonna be able to send that commands or your payload. Um, 
Sometimes it will develop scheduled task persistence. This really depends on the iteration. Uh, some groups have seen some intel where it has, and some have seen where it just kind of sits and floats out in the ether. Now, it has hard-coded servers. This means that the IPs are right frickin' there in the code. Uh, the indicators of compromise are stupid easy. I mean, it, they're right there. You can see, oh, this IP, Jesus Christ. But there are different strains of Goot Loader, so that's something to keep in mind. It does not always deliver a payload I say this because this is really important. Sometimes people like to give access as a service. They'll compromise a machine, make sure they can get a C2 beacon to it, make sure it has persistence, and they'll sell that access to somebody else to do as they want with it. Now, again, don't confuse it with GootKit. You've probably heard of GootKit. This is a payload. Okay, so here is one of our biggest tests. This is the one that I wrote myself execution from a compressed JavaScript file. Uh, this test mimics that execution, and when it's successful, it launches calculator.exe. Something important to note is that it's test, uh, focusing on the method used to reach the execution, not the thing that's executed. Uh, this is an important piece that many detectors leave out. So what I did here was almost directly copy in uh, everything that I really wanted from Gootloader. I said, oh yeah, so it runs with JavaScript uh, and it opens things in WScript and just opens something that's not going to destroy a machine because that's not very nice. Um, this is the closest test that you are going to find in the repo to all-in-one Gootloader behavior, but it does miss some pieces and that's where we come in with the next tests. System data to environment variables. This is another big indicator. Uh, C script to W script usage to run JavaScript. Uh, the local inf computer information is going to be collected, compiled, encoded, and sent off to C2 server. Okay, what else? There's encoded PowerShell and registry. Now, if you've ever worked in a SOC, you're gonna stop and look at this one and say, oh God, why would you choose this? Because everything is encoded. Every single darn thing is encoded in base 64. So this isn't really gonna be your best indicator, but it is a good test to point out because in some cases, you're gonna wanna see what all is being base 64 encoded. You're gonna wanna make sure that you're actually picking up on that. Um, and yeah, Gootloader uses base 64 encoding when it's pulling all that environment data, packaging it up, and sending it out to C2. What else we got? We have encoded data to URL. There's that base64 encoded data, and it's gonna go ahead and push out to the URL. Here's where your network monitoring is gonna be really, really useful, because it's gonna pick up on that being sent out, hopefully, if you have the detector for it. We'll get to that later. Uh, Wscript and Cscript launch C2 beacon that posts base64 encoded gzip of environment information, then they send it through HTTP cookies, which is a very interesting way to send it. Um, now, in this one, I made a couple of modifications to the command that's in the repo, which is uh, I adjusted the curl command. Um, I specifically uh, um, adjusted it so that it would be for cookies rather than just for the base URL. And then we have scheduled tasks and command lines. Remember how I said that sometimes it's persistent, sometimes it likes sticking around on machines? Well, this is gonna emulate that. Um, it uses PowerShell to create a scheduled task that spawns PowerShell, um, and it's just, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, now, this one I did change uh, command.exe to just PowerShell. Uh, that's the only change, though. I mean, if you're still just testing to see if it's launching something via scheduled task, it's still gonna show up just fine, so. All right, so uh, we have our tests. That's cool and all. Uh, we've ran them, now what? Uh, we've run through some stuff that should definitely be setting off some alarm bells. Now, if you didn't turn off Defender, I'm gonna remind you, turn off Defender. Uh, you, again, you don't wanna do that in production, but turn off Defender. So let's take a look at our alerts and our logs. We're gonna go into Security Onion, and we're gonna look for all these little things that we just ran. We're gonna see if we can pick them out. And if we can't, we'll get to that later. So this is what logs are gonna look like in Security Onion. 
they're gonna be a little nasty. But as you start searching through these logs more and more, you're gonna get a better idea of how they work, what these fields mean. And especially with an environment that you've built yourself, you're not gonna be looking at a bunch of crap that somebody put into fields and going like, what the hell is this supposed to be? You put that in there, it's gonna make it much easier. So right here you can see some sequence numbers for what the actual, um, uh, what the actual number of the data was in the sequence, right? Uh, you're gonna have your host name, you're gonna have your versions, you're gonna have your applications, which is where things start getting more interesting. It's gonna be a string of just whatever the hell's going on on that machine. And you're gonna have a bunch of other stuff that's probably gonna be empty. It's fine, it's expected. Um, these logs are a lot to look at, but that's why Security Onion has a lot of different tabs so that you can drill down a little deeper, you can find logs in different places that you can understand a little easier. The alert, Hunt and Kibana tabs are several markers that will help you find this information very quickly. Um, so one of the really important things that you want to keep in mind is the fields that you're actually looking for. Uh, I ran a script t1027.ps1, and if I can look for the name of that script, it'll help me get a better understanding of whether it actually alerted or not, and it'll help me understand what the event looks like. So you can search for that directly without any other arguments and it'll pull up alerts, or you can use the machine IP address or the name. Uh, you can use the string PowerShell or the user you executed it with. All of these are fine. When you're first starting with threat hunting, this is where you wanna be. You wanna make it easy on yourself. Um, so in other atomic tests, you're probably gonna be searching for something different from this. Uh, perhaps you're gonna be looking for network connections or executions using different programs. The important part to keep in mind is the pieces of a test that can help you identify its behavior and the detectors that would be needed to pick up on that. So, what if there's no alert? Uh, it happens, and actually that's a good thing. Um, you found a blind spot in your detections by doing this, and something isn't working properly. This right here is a playbook. I know you can't really see it very well, don't worry about it. Uh, in the Security Onion Playbooks tab. When installed, this will communicate with Elastalert and allow you to start seeing those alerts. So it's actually kind of plug and play in this sense. You literally just go out, you find playbooks that you really like for the things that you're running, you check and see how they work. They have a listing of all of their, uh, all their detection logic there in the playbook. You install them and you're done. Now, a quick note on threatening or threat hunting. Portmanteaus are fun. If you're looking for a threat and you know what it is, take notes on its known indicators of compromise. You're not gonna run out and you're gonna say, I wanna find Gootloader, and literally just be searching for the string Gootloader. You're gonna be searching for WScript. You're gonna be searching for JavaScript. You're gonna be searching for all these little things that it does. Keep this in mind all the time. Write it down, have it next to you. You never know what's gonna show up. Start back from worst case scenario, full compromise, go straight to the, the doom mode, and then start working your way backwards towards the beginning of the kill chain. Assume that bad has happened. Don't just pray it hasn't. There's a lot here. If it walks and it honks like a goose, it's not usually a chicken in a goose costume. Likelihood is important. Uh, they say this all the time in med school, you shouldn't be looking for a zebra when there's a horse. It's probably not an APT if you're not a common APT target. For heaven's sake, I don't know how many times I've seen people going like, maybe it's this thing that I read about in the news. It's not. You work at a Wendy's. So, you know, keep that in mind. Keep your likelihood in mind. And finally, the most beautiful part, the reason why we're all here, think like an attacker. Hunting in Security Onion looks like this. This is the hunt tab. You hunt. You can start to learn um, Onion Query Language, which is basically just leucine. Uh, this is something that you're going to see in Splunk. You're gonna see it in uh, regular Elastic, which this is kind of just a bit of a modification on Elasticsearch. You're gonna see it in all sorts of different uh, seams and log management solutions. So learn Lucene. It's very important. This will actually get you very far. 
And look at those command lines. What's that right there? There's an environment data pole right there. If I could, is this a laser? It might be. Damn it, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if you look over at get item path env winder, that right there is some environment data being pulled. It looks insane. This looks like garbage. But if you take it piece by piece, you look up the bits you don't understand, and you just keep working your way through it, then eventually you'll start to understand kind of what it does. This is, again, an important part of threat hunting. We don't walk in and assume that we know everything that's going in, on in the logs. In fact, we assume we know nothing. We look things up. And this is what elastic logs look like. This is a little bit cleaner than what we saw um, in Security Onion. It was kind of just a little, little icky. But this is what you're going to see in most real world seams. So, get used to the look of this and cross-reference it to all the different other areas that you can find your logs in, in alerts and in hunting, right? So, now that we've gone through an absolute tech dump, what does this look like in real life? When I was working in an MDR, we had actually almost an identical setup to this. This was a real company. This was an enterprise that was making a lot of money and was running things for tons of large companies. We used a direct feed into Elastic from customers' data lakes. Literally, they just poured in data into uh, what we call the data lake, and we pulled it from Elastic. And then we used Elastic to parse through that information and hunt. It looked almost identical to this. Uh, all the pieces that you just did were split up, though because it would be this process times a thousand, dozens and dozens of customers, hundreds to thousands of machines to ingest from, an enormous array of interests from all sorts of different products. This went far beyond WinLogBeat into Google Cloud, Azure, endpoint detection solutions, pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, we had to be extremely flexible while maintaining data integrity from every single new source. This is chaos. Thank your ingest engineers. So that's what an MDR actually looks like in real life. That's what threat hunting looks like in real life. I kid you not, there's no exaggeration there. Um, what does an atomic deployment, however, look like on a large scale? First, detectors don't tend to be directly provisioned into production. They need to be tested first. So new detections will be brought into a staging environment and a fresh atomic test catering to that detection will be run. After that detection has been tested and confirmed working, it might be deployed into production and tuned to the liking of the analysts and detection engineers to remove false positives. Then an entire gauntlet of regular atomic testing, usually scripted, so it doesn't have to be written out every time because that would be a lot for thousands of machines, uh, is scheduled and run to confirm that the detections continue to work even with tuning. As you tune, things are going to change in the environment. It's important that you make sure that things continue to work. So what? Why is this important? You just built an environment extremely similar to ones used in production instances and in some cases identical. You've just tested a freely available detector and learned about what it actually did. You just learned about where everything is in a commonly available security incident event manager and whether your detectors are actually working. You've learned where to find additional detectors and where you can build them if you want to fill in the gaps, which is the playbook tool that's included in Security Onion. And you've learned about an excellent method of testing pretty much any detector, which is Atomic Red Team. So, these are some sources for you. These are extremely important. While you're building your lab, you're going to want these. And remember, you don't have to worry too much if you can't get them right now. They're going to be on my website. Um, I'm going to pull out my contact slides so that you can grab my whatever details. Um, 
yeah, Atomic Red Team site, important. Go ahead and explore. Take a look at all the tests. They're really cool. You'll find things that are for very bizarre threats that you probably never knew existed. Uh, you're also going to find the Security Onion Wiki, full of install guides, tools, recommendations to get you started. Um, it's a lot, but if you read through it and you take it slow, and again, take a couple of weekends and relax, it'll be okay. PF Sense. That has a hell of a learning curve, actually. It's that slight learning curve, it's pretty bad. Um, if you really want to dig into configuring PF Sense after you set up your initial lab and you start messing with it a little bit, then that's where you're going to want to do it. Uh, if you're new to detailed network configuration, it's going to suck. Um, but this can actually help you learn how networks work a little bit better. Uh, there we go. We've got the Atomic Red Team GitHub, just in case you want to contribute. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, all these tests are made by people like you. Uh, I had no idea how these worked. I had never contributed to GitHub before. I didn't know how to. And I just did it. And it went pretty okay. Uh, and here's some community rule repos that you can implement in your test environment. What are these? These are massive lists of good rules detectors that you can just load straight in and you can see how they work and you can see what they pick up. Elastic, uh, Sigma, slash Playbook. Playbook is the thing that's already built in. And Splunk, which can be implemented directly in attack range if you so choose to use it. And here's our test list. So with that, I would love some questions. I love questions. No, that was a lot. I know, I understand. So, well, we're super duper early. I thought that would take a lot longer. Uh, in fact, most of the time it did uh, whenever I was practicing it. But I think, uh, I think that was a thing. If you want me to explain anything over a little bit more, please let me know. Walk right on up to that mic and let me know. No? Not everybody too shy? Okay, that's fine. Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. Jeez, guys, come on. I need your help. <laughs> okay. Do, 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 do. Where's the contact information? There it is. Okay. That little bit right there at the bottom. Uh, that website is going to have these slides. It's going to have all sorts of fun deets. It's going to have some of my articles if you're curious about some of the stuff I've done in the past. And yeah, feel free to hit me up on DEF CON social. If you're not on Mastodon, get on Mastodon. It's a lot better than Twitter. I promise. <laughs>